Welcome to the Cryptocurrencies, the Future of Digital Money show. I'm very pleased to have Chris Coney on. He's the founder of Cryptoversity, and we're doing this on January 2nd, 2019. So this is the first interview I'm recording this year, and I'm, I'm happy to have Chris back on with us. We talked over a year ago. Things were very different. It was Q4 2017. Um, Bitcoin, you just had to wake up in the morning and somebody else was bidding it up. Um, irregardless of what was going on and and then in 2018 we saw the opposite basically we saw pe people just bidding it down irregardless of uh, irrespective of what's going on so we saw both the bubble and the anti-bubble um, mentality in 2017-2018 and 2019 looks to us as the year that institutional investors will start to determine the real price the real value and uh, we'll enter the space in terms of funding. So I'm, I'm very happy to have Chris uh, back on to talk about these um, very important topics that are going on in the sector. Chris, how are you? I'm doing very well today, Benji. Thank you. How are you? So, well, I'm doing I'm doing fantastic. I'm here in Koh Samui, Thailand. Uh, there's going to be a huge, huge storm, the biggest one in 50 years projected for Friday. So that's in two days from now. Um, but for now, the, the sky is clear. Everything's uh, beautiful. Um, but obviously, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a huge storm that is forecasted. And it reminds me about the, the huge storm that is forecasted in the stock markets and everywhere else in the economy right now. Um, and, and I want to start off with asking you, Chris, um, we've seen Bucked, which is the, the most important institutional development in the space, being delayed from January 24th. To an unknown date so we don't know when ice the uh, ice which obviously is the uh, international exchange inc that owns also the new york stock exchange so they're a huge huge deal and a great company in and of it of themselves uh, since going public that company has gone up about 22 times so uh, in, in value so that is a, a phenomenal company in and of itself but i want to ask you about their announcement they're delaying bucked uh, which is a very uh, important deal for everyone, for institutions, because this is the, cust the custodian service that was missing for them. How is this going to impact um, the, the blockchain sector and the crypto sector in the, sh in the short term? And do you think that it really has any effect on the long term? Okay, sure. So I don't think it's Beck's decision. I, um, I've actually got their little press release here. And it says the launch has previously been set for the 24th of January, but we will it will be amended pursuant to the CFTC's process and timeline. So just like when they originally announced it, and when they set the 24th of January date, it did have a little asterisk next to it. And I looked at the footnotes and it was like pending, reg, pending regulatory approval. So they had that in their back pocket just in case, you know, they, uh, they didn't get the regulatory approval in time. So when I read things like this, I'm like, well, it sounds like they're ready to go. It literally is just the regulators given them the okay to launch. But it says pursuant to the CFTC's timeline. We have absolutely no idea what that means. Does that mean one month delay, one week, six months, a year? We don't really know, do we? So this is this is this has two this has two impacts on the market, as as most uh, events do. There's a there's a perceptual, what we could call a speculative effect, and then it'll have a fundamental effect. So those are the two main forces, right? So a speculative effect is the whole crypto space is, you know, last year we were sort of um, we were sort of resting very, very hard on the ETF approval. Everyone was leaning on that, relying on that to to bring you know, to bring the market back. Um, of course, that kept getting denied, denied and many different proposals remain in under consideration. There are another set of decisions coming up in February with the SEC to approve any, a number of different ETFs. So that's that. But then BACT came along in the latter part of the year as a physically settled contract. So in terms of fundamentals, so that, that's the perceptual bit. Any kind of delay, any time where the market's expectations are not met, right, then that, again, that has a speculative effect on the market. Looking at the the Bitcoin chart right now, though, it, it's it's pretty stable. So the market hasn't reacted that badly to back to being delayed. So that's the truth the market is telling us right now. So it doesn't seem to have have had such a bad speculative impact in terms of the fundamental impact going forward. 
that still remains as huge as ever. There is there is just so I can I, in my mind's eye I just think about all of the regular investors that have you know financial advisors Fidelity or whoever um, and their their clients are coming to them saying can you get me invested in Bitcoin and the financial advisors are basically saying well no <laughs> I, I'm not allowed to because it's unregulated I don't actually have any regulated financial products to put your money into and and they can't just go and set up a Coinbase account for their client. They just can't do that, right? They're not allowed to do that. So all of that money, but this under management and uh, the, the amateur investors are asking their financial advisors about, that's all waiting for, for this gateway. And the main difference with BACT, as opposed to all these other uh, futures contracts before, is that they are you know, it's physically settled. BACT is going to provide warehousing services, custody, and so on. So how this is going to impact the market is not just in terms of creating demand for Bitcoin to be bought from the market, but also the um, there's going to be a reasonable quantity of Bitcoin that's going to be held in custody, basically removed from circulating supply, because I don't I don't anticipate that these types of investors will be trading in and out much. It may just be a case of the average investor just wants five percent of the you know their fidelity portfolio allocating to Bitcoin, and that will be done probably by, via the backed product. But I don't imagine that's going to move much. So if backed ends up with 100,000 or, I don't know, a million Bitcoin in their in their digital warehouse, it's not going to move around much. So that, that pulls a, a certain amount of Bitcoin out of circulating supply. And when you, when you have a lower circulating supply of a coin, generally that increases volatility, right? So um, that, that might actually bring some more volatility to the market. If there is a lot of trading, though, in and out, well, that will boost liquidity and actually that will actually calm the volatility. So that's it could go both ways. But in my view, for the type of investors that BACT is going to be serving, it seems more logical to me that it would be it would be warehoused and wouldn't move much, which would lead to an increase in volatility. So that's uh, that's my outlook on BACT for the time being. Well, let's talk about the fundamentals a little bit. Uh, wh why don't you uh, go over with us everything that went on in 2018 regarding the Lightning Network so people can understand more of what's going on behind the scenes because <clears throat> obviously uh, by looking at uh, coinmarketcap.com every day, you don't get the perception um, of what's really going on. And I, I love to always go back to Buffett uh, who says, Price gives you nothing. Value gives you everything. And and so why don't we talk about what's going on behind the scenes? What sort of progress has been made uh, this year? And what do you anticipate are uh, going to be the milestones to achieve in 2019 in terms of the technology, in terms of how um, they improve the adaptability and the capabilities of it? Okay, okay. So in 2019, there are now multiple developer developer groups that are working on different implementations of the Bitcoin Lightning Network, which is the second layer that's going to allow much higher transactional volume without putting a burden on the main blockchain. So this is good because then, like Satoshi said in like 2010 or 11, when, um, when Bitcoin reached version 0 0.1, its fundamental architecture was fixed forever because as more and more... Um, applications and, and people build on top of Bitcoin, it's relying on some very fundamental mechanisms that now cannot be changed, much like the internet. The base layer of the internet is, you know, it, it, it could be improved greatly. It just can't be because there's now so much stacked on top of it. Um, we just add layers on top to uh, to innovate. So we've got multiple developing development groups working on different implementations like uh, C Lightning and the LND group and all these other implementations. There's the Zap desktop wallet that's out now. If any listener wants to download and try that, that does work. And what amazes me about the Bitcoin community in particular is um, is they're not they're not scared to test stuff. So even though the Lightning is still considered as highly experimental, there's still I think there's something like 400 BTC locked up in the Lightning network. Don't quote me on that, but I haven't got the numbers to hand, but the, I'm going to see if I can pull up the statistics here. Yeah, this is, I'm getting this from uh, 1ml.com, which is the real-time Lightning Network statistics. So there are now 5,000 Lightning nodes 
17,000 channels, and there's a total of 532 Bitcoin locked up in uh, in all these payment channels, like $2 million on a supposedly experimental network. But you know, that's what I mean. The, the Bitcoin community is not not frightened to put some to some put some uh, money at risk to test the stuff because it's about innovation. It's about pushing it forward. What's interesting about the Lightning Network right now is the uh, the median fee <laughs> for a transaction is well, like it's it's uh, how many zeros is on that? It's like seven or eight zeros of decimal place to a penny. So it's something like a hundred millionth of a penny per transaction, which is which is very interesting. So that's now rocking and rolling. It, you can actually use it. They say it's experimental, but it's actually working. So multiple development groups, the network is running. If you look at the visual representation of Lightning, it's just, it's, it looks a mess because there are so many channels now. So that's there. In fact, I have actually recently set up a Lightning node myself uh, to like receive donations and, and make sales of um, of my courses and so on, which later on we'll, we'll go on to talk about uh, BTC Pay, which is uh, the software that allows you to become your own payment processor. But uh, we, we could talk about that all, now or later. So that's really the state of the Lightning Network. Uh, Litecoin also continues to work on their Lightning Network, and they had a bit of a breakthrough recently, which I'm not going to go into right now because we'll just stick to stick to Bitcoin. But similarly, Lightning technology is being deployed on um, on Litecoin. It's I think it's already been deployed on the likes of Decred. And when all these Lightning networks are running, that allows you to do things like cross-chain trades via atomic swaps, because you just you know lock the two assets up in a in a channel exchange them via signatures, and it's almost like a fully decentralized trustless exchange. So the more this lightning technology gets rolled out on other coins, uh, the more that kind of thing can start to happen. So this is good. Um, so that was the that was the outlook. What was the other parts of your question? Can you remind me? Well, no, you covered everything, Chris. I wanted to, I wanted to go with you over um, one of the uh, letters that we published in uh, in the early parts of Q4 of this year, of 2018, and we made the connection between the market, the stock market rally in 2017 and the FANG, the FANG's, uh, the FANG stocks rallying into 2018. Uh, and we made the connection between that and the bull market for cryptocurrencies. Uh, the NASDAQ and uh, Bitcoin and, and in general cryptocurrencies are very technology oriented and we saw a real boom in technology stocks and biotechnology going into 2017 2018 and we saw uh, the beginnings of, of a bust in early 2018 for the stock market we saw a correction and obviously we saw the, the, the cryptocurrency market breaking down and now we've seen a full collapse of the stock market uh, going down to, into bear market territory and obviously uh, this coincided with a huge drop in the price of Bitcoin and in, in all cryptocurrencies. We see a really big connection and a correlation between technology companies or NASDAQ and cryptocurrencies and, and going forward we think that the connection will, will remain there. Now, what I wanted to uh, what I wanted to run by you and ask you your opinion, your analysis of, is do you think that the uh, that Bitcoin and uh, all the other altcoins receive a lot of buying from investors who love technology? You just said that they love to test stuff, they love to to try out new new things. Is this market right now predominantly? Um, dominated by people who like to be first and that like to try technologies and, and, are, and are interested in just breakthrough, disturbing, uh, I'm sorry, disrupting technologies. No, I think we're past that point, to be perfectly honest. Uh, the last statistic that I saw um, estimating the number of Bitcoin holders was 35 million, which was up like six or seven X on the previous year. So I don't think there's that, obviously in the world, there are plenty more technology enthusiasts than that. But to begin with, when Bitcoin had no price as such, like right in the early days, when the developers were just mining on their own computers and so on, it started out like a digital collectible Bitcoin. And it was only when it first got listed on an exchange and had a price that then led to the infamous two pizzas for 10,000 Bitcoin transaction. 
and the the way the person arrived at that price wasn't uh, just because they speculated of the ten thousand. It's because it did actually get listed on an exchange to get a price, and then that's the basis on which they thought ten thousand Bitcoin was worth twenty dollars. But honestly, from where I'm sitting as sort of a content creator, as an educator, I I do ask my students, you know, what do they do for a living? And it's all manner of people, people on minimum wage. I've got doctors, I've got engineers, I've got lawyers and every, everyone in between. Um, and in, if, you, if you looked at the inside of my sort of private chat group, the types of questions people ask range anywhere from quite advanced trading questions right out to very, very basic things. And to me, the crypto thing isn't just a business. And a lot of people are called to it, you know, almost like as a higher purpose thing, as well as it being kind of cool, you know, kind of techy. But it has this humanitarian component to it. And I think that is what's attracting a whole bunch of people who otherwise would just run a mile from the technical complexity. But once they get the idea, they go, wow, you know, you boil any worldly problem down and stranglehold over the money system allows that to continue. And once you get that idea in your head, you go, well, it's worth figuring out. Right? It's worth freaking out, thinking you're not going to copy and paste the address of your Bitcoin uh, wallet properly and all that kind of stuff. But people persevere because I think the reason they persevere over those technical obstacles is because of that higher purpose and what it's all about. So no, I think we're well past the the innovator stage where it is really just for the the techies. Uh, and now we've got this community of 35 million people of all shapes and sizes. Yeah, definitely. And, and 35 million is obviously less than half a billion people that own stocks. Uh, it's it's not even comparable. I want to ask you, you did a, a video a, a few days ago, and it's called How the Crypto Revolution is Bigger Than the Internet. So can you recap to us a little bit about what you're saying that in that video? Sure, that's actually a little three-part video series that I did. So what's interesting is I, I see the internet almost like, just consider it metaphorically in your mind as like a like a like uh, its own country. Right? And the reason I say that is because it, it has its own economy. People work there. Right? I work entirely on the internet. Right? Um, um, it has properties, it has real estate, like the main names and addresses and all this sort of stuff. So it can be considered like its own economy now when most some people live there, right, all the time. However, up until Bitcoin, it didn't have its own currency. It was still using these national currencies, which was a mismatch. You can't have this, it's not really a country because the internet is the, the global jurisdiction, right? It's the virtual world, the earth. But then it was sort of messy because it still had these localized currencies didn't didn't really work but now you know bitcoin transcends nations and now it has its own currency which similarly transcends uh, national currencies so when i think like that i think back to peter drucker who he said even this was like prior to bitcoin and actually i think he might have said this prior to the internet when he said we are entering the era of the three c's which was accelerated change, um, overwhelming complexity, and tremendous competition. And I've never forgot that since I since I read it. And I read it quite early in my career, actually, before I came across Bitcoin. And that quote was in the forefront of my mind when I really got my head around Bitcoin. I'm like, this is the type of thing that Peter Drucker was talking about. We need things like Bitcoin and blockchain technology in particular if we're going to handle accelerated change, overwhelming complexity and tremendous competition, that that competition piece is a big one, because when back in the day, say even in the, like the 1950s, if you're a local accountancy firm or something, your sphere of competition was pretty much limited to your local city. Right? You maybe have 50 other firms that you're competing with. Right. Um, and everyone went to their local. So that, that had a boundary on competition. Well, as technology grows, that competition went to the nation. Now it's pretty much the world because I can outsource my bookkeeping to India or China or America or South America or anywhere. So now the competition for a bookkeeper or accountancy firm or any professional is now all of the, account the accountants in the world that understand British law or American law. So that's the tremendous competition piece. Access 
to the market, the internet, right, where all the, a lot of the buying and selling goes on, a lot of the economy is, universal access to that market means tremendous competition, but also tremendous complexity. So how do you handle that? Well, the flexibility of national currencies just doesn't cut it. But Bitcoin being this transcendent currency and blockchains in particular, that will help us handle complexity by having, because in a world of chaos, how do you know you need some kind of ground state, you know, something that's solid that you can build on top of? Because you know, like the Forex markets, they're all fiat currencies and all the values are fluctuating in relation to each other. And it's just an absolute, it's a, it's just abject chaos, right? Everything's fluctuating. Whereas a blockchain, not necessarily a crypto, but the but blockchain technology provides that anchor. It's like a heartbeat, you know, that can be relied upon. And Bitcoin's the hardest money we've ever seen. Unlike gold, where if the price goes up, it incentivizes people to mine more gold out of the ground and invest that capital. It doesn't work like that with Bitcoin. It doesn't matter how fast Bitcoin rises in price. You can't dig any Bitcoin out of the ground any faster than 12.5 Bitcoin every 10 minutes. So that's an interesting dichotomy to me. We've got this tremendous complexity. But we've also got that certainty that Bitcoin provides, which is, I think, is a critical tool to deal with the three C's that Peter Drucker talks about. Now, I want to ask Chris, uh, I see a major trend in 2019 with companies launching their own tokens in order to create a mini economy for themselves, their um, obviously their customers, etc. For for a company <clears throat> that has a lot of customers, creating its own currency, its own token is almost it's it guarantees the customer stays around. If you have um, a currency that only is redeemable in a store, in my store, and I keep handing it to you for loyalty, and you can trade it with other people. It's just an insane, insanely good marketing tool, and a lot of companies are engaging in it. Uh, some uh, have already announced this. Some of are, um, it's not announced, but it's it's going to happen. It's going to be big, big in 2019. Do you think that this is um, the killer app that everyone's everyone's waiting for? Nouriel Rubini, who hates cryptocurrencies has said this sector is worth nothing because it doesn't have a killer app it doesn't have something that has changed the world fundamentally and tokenization in 2019 could be that thing could be uh many companies that go out and say we're developing our own blockchain and <clears throat> these are well-known companies and they're going to use a token for payment um, you know, online if you want to if you want to pay and, and and obviously rewarding for loyalty etc. So tell tell us a little bit about what you think about this and uh, how can people and investors get involved with this indirectly by either investing in the in the company that uh, developed these uh, these tokens or in the company that uh, that has requested these tokens. Mm-hmm. So is is the tokenization piece like a killer app i don't think so so think about it prior to blockchain technology which and the reason why we had to have a blockchain technology for this to even be possible is because before satoshi created the the bitcoin infrastructure there was no way to do something that was digital and scarce right if you've got air miles or even world of warcraft gold well, Blizzard can just click a button and you know hyperinflate that currency whenever they want to, so you could never rely on a you know that as a store of value or to have any reliable price. So why wouldn't um, so that's why now you know we've got this ability to do digital scarcity with blockchain. You can now tokenize anything like air miles, loyalty points, etc. I think that will only work with companies with a lot of sales volume, because otherwise that tokenized loyalty point, it will just won't have an, any liquidity, right? It, it, your local boutique fashion store, for example, that you know is an independent, that I, I honestly don't think there's any point in them creating um, a digital token expecting to list it on exchanges and so on. Yes, the technology will allow them to do digital loyalty points at almost zero cost fine right so the person can the customer can use their mobile app to to deepen that relationship but 
who who's going to want to buy that token on an exchange? Hardly anybody, right? Only the other customers of that particular store. So it really takes it to the the household name level, where you've got the Coca Colas and the fast moving consumer goods. Maybe it would work for them. Maybe Air Miles is a good example, because if if I'm a frequent traveler and I've saved up millions and millions of air miles, well, there's enough demand for travel that someone might, I might want to monetize those air miles, right? Sell my Virgin Airlines a million air miles because I'm not going to use them, but I could perhaps sell them for Bitcoin, right? And turn them into Bitcoin, which is a better store of value and is easier to spend, as it were. But I might, I might be willing to sell them at a, you know, 75% of the face value. So then the buyer goes, great, I'll buy a million air miles at 75% of face value and I'll pay you in Bitcoin, great, great stuff. Because then I basically get 100, a million air miles um, and get a 25% discount without the company having to, have it, having to have a run of promotion. Sweet. So use cases like that. Air miles is probably my favorite example of that because it's easy to see how that would work. And uh, there's a lot of transactional volume in you know, a value flying through, excuse the pun, flying through airlines and so on. So that would work. But not for like a local boutique store. I don't, I don't really see that happening. Because otherwise, why? Just think about it prior to blockchain again. Why don't companies already create their own or private currencies that you can only spend with them? Well, because it creates unnecessary friction, right? It actually creates a problem rather than solves it. So you have to you have to think begin with the end in mind and think, all right, if you're going to tokenize something, what problem does it solve? Well, in the case of air miles, it solves the problem of a frequent flyer. Who's got so many air miles they're never going to spend and wants to monetize that value so they can sell it for less than face value and get some Bitcoin. That's a real problem with a real solution. So in that regard, yes. Now, Chris, uh, could you tell people a little bit more about what you do with Cryptoversity and how they can uh, <clears throat> follow you, get involved, and all the good stuff? Absolutely. So um, Cryptoversity was um, an idea I came up with in it was late 2015 and formally started it in April 2016 because I identified that the biggest thing that was missing in the crypto space was a, a good educational curriculum. It was scattered all over the internet and it was just like amateur videos and you know there's no real structured curriculum that people could start knowing nothing and end knowing something. So I thought, right, this is, this is what I'm going to do. So that's what I've been doing ever since then. So it was the world's first online school specializing in teaching courses on Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, and blockchains. So now it lives at the uh, website address cryptoasset.school. And I've sort of laid this out for people depending on where they're at in their uh, whole cryptocurrency educational journey. So I've recently released that uh, series that you just mentioned, which was how the crypto revolution is bigger than the internet. I created that as a three, uh, a free three-part video series for people who are still like, why? Why does this matter? Who, why, why does everyone care? Why do I know people who are going crazy and are so excited about this thing? I just don't get it. So I thought, right, let me formalize that. So that's just a free video series that'll explain why crypto matters. And then from there, you can decide if you want to do anything else with it. Um, following on from that, I then have you know, a proper curriculum. I've now built seven online courses, each one with a specific outcome, whether it's um, blockchain security essentials to make sure you're uh, you don't get hacked and make your crypto impossible to steal, whether it's if you want to um, master cryptocurrency trading or if you want to know the history of money and all that kind of stuff. So the whole point of those things is they are structured curricula where you start knowing nothing and end knowing something specific. You'll have a specific outcome. And then finally, for people who are already well educated, I've created a, uh, a way to basically help me with my life mission, which which predated cryptoversity. So my life mission is to lead people to freedom through education and awareness. That's how I knew cryptoversity was a business I, I, I should start because it fits, you know, it's a vehicle through which I can carry out that mission. So uh, getting Bitcoin into more and more people's hands is something I like to do. So I thought, how do I do that? But well, rather than giving large chunks of money to the big advertising companies of the world, like the Googles and the Facebooks and so on, I would much rather give it to you know independent promoters. So that's where I created my affiliate program, where you know, if you tell people about Cryptoversity and they sign up as a student, well, obviously you get a commission for that, but you get a monthly commission that's paid to you in Bitcoin. So that's another way of me helping crypto adoption by 
distributing it to you know independent promoters that provide a valuable service find you know telling someone about this educational resource helping me carry out my mission of leading people to freedom for education and awareness and the third win is that they actually earn a passive income in bitcoin so i thought that's actually my favorite one because it's win 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 that one chris i like uh, i really want to thank you for taking the time and, and doing this interview uh early on in 2019 and do you want to tell us a little bit about the outlook for 2019 on your end what do you think uh, will happen here Oh, sure. So on that tokenization piece, we were talking about tokenization of things like air miles and so on. Where tokenization is really going to take off is with these STOs as opposed to ICOs. So that's a security token offering instead of a uh, initial coin offering. So initial coin offerings is that thing we just talked about. Some independent company says, we're going to launch this token, which you can only spend with us or on our network. Less likely because it relies on massive demand for the product. And it creates, a, it creates a gated community, basically. So you're not allowed in here. You're not allowed to consume this value unless you buy our token. Right, fine. That might work if you can create enough demand. But as a startup, you're, you've got an uphill battle as it is. So that might create unnecessary friction for people, especially if there's no liquidity for that particular token. However, what there is plenty of liquidity for are traditional assets, real estate investments, you know, equities, blah, blah, blah. And again, that has the same problem of being in these legacy systems that weren't really built for the internet era. So how do you how do you transfer ownership of a US stock you know, across the internet? Well, you use blockchain technology, right? So these security token offerings is where you can tokenize stocks, you can tokenize real estate, you can tokenize fine art, and then anyone in the world who's got an internet connection and a bit of Bitcoin can buy and sell them. I think that's gonna be huge, right? Um, back to Bitcoin ETFs, that's gonna be a big topic this year. I say keep an eye out for nations turning their currencies into cryptocurrencies. We saw in 2018 the El Petro Venezuelan cryptocurrency backed by their oil reserves. I've already seen stirrings that Iran might do it. They might, uh, what, what should we call it, crypt, kryptonize their currency, and with the purpose being to, to you know, circumvent U.S. sanctions. I expect this to happen more and more and more once they see the benefits of this technology uh, to make themselves sovereign they'll probably do it. Unfortunately, a lot of these things will be just national cryptocurrencies, so they won't be free, open, and borderless. That's probably why they'll have a trust element to them. I expect interest rates to continue to rise, Federal Reserve in particular. That's going to put a squeeze on all the debt around the world, corporate debt, private debt, and so on. That increases the risk of financial crisis. If we do get a financial crisis this year, it'll answer the question we've all been asking, which is how does crypto perform during a financial crisis? Maybe we'll get an answer to that this year. Maybe not. <laughs> I do think, though, that if um, if the economy does start to turn in the US, the Fed will probably change their mind and start putting interest rates back down again, right? Because because the, the, I don't think the economy is strong enough to handle higher interest rates. Um, two other things to look out for. If you've ever heard of Hedera Hashgraph, they did a private token sale to accredited investors last year. Very high performance, distributed ledger technology, they're going for sort of the blue chip enterprise market. They've gone underground to begin development. So they're going to reappear sometime this year and surprise us all with something fantastic, no doubt. And finally, last year, Telegram, Telegram Messenger also did their own little private token sale and raised money in the billions from accredited investors as well. So they're going to resurface, resurface any minute, hopefully with a product of some kind. Chris, thank you very, very much. Um, we'll definitely have you back on uh, in the near future. Thank you, mate. Look forward to it.